Hello everyone, it's already nine, so we can begin the lecture. Um, today we will have only one hour of lecture. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I've got some private business to do later, but we will make up for this lost hour. I, I, I can promise that we should have enough time for that. Okay, uh, last time we were discussing the Riemann curvature tensor and its applications. Uh, and we also had a board lecture which involved the Christoffel symbols. Uh, yeah, and this is what we will begin with today. I, I would like to, I would like us to go back to the board lecture and there is a couple of things we need to do. Uh, I want to redo the example where we were calculating the Christoffel symbols of the metric in Newtonian perturbation theory, in Newtonian approximation, and then we will do two examples of calculating the Riemann tensor of a given metric tensor. So I will share the screen right now. So we will do the Newtonian approximation. I'm not entirely happy with the way we have done it last time. And this calculating the Christoffel symbols of a given metric is one of most important skills uh, you should develop during this lecture. So I would like to do this example again in slow motion so that everybody could follow exactly how we proceed because there are some subtle steps there. So if you remember, the metric took the form of minus dt squared. Uh, for people who have just uh, logged in and joined us, uh, we'll have only a one hour lecture today without a break. Uh, this depends only on xi plus let's say dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared one minus two phi of x i and we will assume that phi is a very small number and also that its derivatives are very small so we can neglect all quadratic terms mm. We can also write this part of the metric as delta i j dx i dx j. So if you remember, I have shown you the uh, Lagrangian method of determining the Christoffel symbols. Basically, write down the Lagrangian for a geodesic, which amounts to writing one half and then replacing all the x's by appropriate uh, derivatives with respect to the parameter. Mm, with a minus here, sorry. Plus one minus two phi delta i j x dot i x dot j. Uh, and now this is a Lagrangian, which is a function of the three positions, t, x, y, z, and their derivatives, t, x dot, t dot, x dot, y dot, z dot. We calculate the Euler-Lagrange equations. So we take the full derivative with respect to lambda. Lambda is the parameter, so x, y, z, t, are functions of lambda. We take formally the derivatives with respect to each of the derivatives of each component minus the L over the X mu, and this should be zero. Yeah. So after appropriate differentiation, I will not repeat this part. You can show that the resulting equations take the following form. It's two plus two phi, let's say, I divided over one minus two phi x dot k t dot equal to zero. So x i remember it's just a different notation for x y z. And the second equation, let me write it below x k double dot minus two phi 
m one minus two phi x dot m x dot m no x dot k sorry plus phi k one minus two phi and here we obtain t dot squared plus let's say delta pq x dot p x dot q this is also equal to zero and that's the euler lagrange equations and now the trick is to read all the coefficients of all the christoffel symbols from what we have here so this is supposed to be of the form x double dot mu plus gamma mu alpha beta x dot alpha x dot beta equals to zero Okay, the first equation is relatively easy. Um, so we write the answer on the second layer here. So we've got gamma naught. Uh, so it seems that there is only one type of coefficients which does not vanish, and this is basically uh, gamma naught, not k where k runs from one to three, it numbers the spatial components. Uh, an important point here again is to notice that uh, this guy, uh, that there's this two coefficient here, but it simply corresponds to the fact that the summation over here involves zero k and k zero, x dot zero, x dot k, x dot k, x dot zero, both of which are identical. So for different values of indices here, we've got a double summation and hence the two. So for a single Christopher symbol, which is what we are more interested in, gamma z zero k, which is the same as gamma zero k zero, that's uh, a single phi k, one minus two phi. And all other vanish. So let's write them explicitly. Gamma zero zero is equal to zero. Gamma zero k l is equal to zero. And now this equation, which is a little bit harder because it contains more terms. Uh, and what I will do now is that I will simply rewrite this equation a little, little bit. Uh, just to make it a little simpler to work with. So, uh, so the index indices here have been risen and lowered by delta ij, which is which is basically a flat metric. So I can easily write that this is the same as the x double dot k minus. And now I will do a bit trick, a small trick with this term here. So there's, there remains the option of simply calculating all possible types of uh, Christopher symbols. Uh, gamma one, two, three, gamma one, one, three, and so on separately. Uh, but there's also a, a faster way and somewhat more elegant I will show you right now. And we can write it as x dot L delta Okay, uh, let's write it this way. Uh, yeah, and then we've got plus I L delta K L over one minus two phi T dot squared plus um, I L. So I have risen this in this lowered index K 
to an upper one and then rename the index k into l here just to just to be able to use k as an uh, unsummed index that's the whole trick here uh, it will also help me a little bit with reading of the results and here i'm left with delta pq x dot p x dot q and this is zero so now let's read off the coefficients and in fact we can do it so in principle we could do it by first considering uh, the situation where all three indices the k and ij are different and then calculating this expression over here in this case uh, then when two, two of them are the same and calculating them again so that would be option number one option one calculate separately gamma let's say one 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 gamma two 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 uh, as i explained before since the spatial components are in the are completely equivalent in this formulation it's enough to read one of them and then just substitute the index one for two and three then gamma one one two and associated gamma two two one gamma two two three etc then gamma one two two gamma uh, one three three etc and finally gamma one two three equivalent to gamma one three two gamma two one three etc so we could in principle calculate them separately and that's fine but we can also do a little better and a little faster if we do the following so let's have a look at this first term over here Mm. I'll change the color. Let's say to this one. Um, we can write it in the following way. This is minus two phi m delta k l over one minus two phi. x dot m x dot l but note that this is completely symmetric with respect to the two indices and because of that we can symmetrize these indices over here but once we do it we very quickly realize that this is simply a part of the contribution to the uh to the gamma coefficient over here right because gamma is by definition symmetric something symmetric multiplied by products x dot alpha x dot beta so this over here is simply the contribution to k ml uh, component of the uh, Christopher symbols uh, so let's be write down this contribution this is minus two by i delta chi kj recall that this is the symmetrization symbol so a k l is just a one half a k l plus one half a l k and this is divided by one one minus two phi but that's not the end of the story because we've got more terms to go this term over here if you think of that it contains only the zero zero part so contributes only So let's go back here. Mm. 
Mm. This is a separate method of calculation we are not following here. Uh, so gamma k, now we should do it on a different place. Gamma k zero zero contains uh, the term phi l delta k l divided by one minus two phi. Good. And then we've got the last term. Uh, again, it's explicitly symmetric in PQ, so it simply called so it simply contributes to gamma k PQ. In order to understand this contribution in in our language, we need to re rename the indices P uh, and Q to I and J, and that's it. So this term contributes to this to this one, and it gives us phi. I write it here. Phi differentiated with respect to L delta I J delta K L, and this is divided by one minus two phi. Uh, and there is also the mixed terms, but nothing contributes to them, so they're equal to zero. And this is equal to gamma k i zero. So this way we obtained explicit expressions for each of these uh, terms uh, separately. And the trick was simply to think, uh, to rewrite all these terms explicitly in terms of the product of x dot index one, x dot index two, and the symmetrized object over here. Symmetric or at least or, or symmetrized, it's not explicitly symmetric. And then the components of the symmetric objects translate immediately to the contributions to the appropriate gamma coefficients. Okay, uh, in the last step, we can neglect the quadratic terms, which means simply neglecting two phi in the denominator, and we can just write that this is uh, minus two phi i symmetrized delta k j plus phi l delta i j delta k l and and we can perform something similar here and we obtain simply phi l delta k l mm. okay and also here this is just phi k uh, K00 zero zero is already here. Okay, very good. Any questions to this part? Okay, I don't see any. And if this is so, uh, we can go to the next problem. So we will not now uh, calculate the curvature tensor for a uh, two sphere. A two-sphere is just a sphere as you know it in dimension three. Uh, so let me go back. Uh, let me go back to the metric tensor. Uh, so in fact, we have already calculated the Christopher symbols on the previous lecture. The metric tensor has this form over here, if you remember. This is the form of the of the metric. Uh, we have calculated the Christopher symbols. This is our coordinate system, and we know that gamma one to two is minus sine theta cosine theta, and gamma two one two is equal to cotangent theta, and that's the same as gamma two to one and everything else vanishes 
And now the task is to calculate the Riemann tensor gamma A, B, C, D. A runs from one to two. Okay, so the first question is, how many independent comp components do we really have in the Riemann tensor in dimension two? So if you remember, the Riemann tensor is anti-symmetric with respect to each of these pairs over here. So all we can plug in is just one, two, and one, two, or one, two, two, one, or one, two, or two, one, one, two, or, or something like that. But because of this anti-symmetry, all of these components are related to each other. Uh, these are the only options we have to obtain a non-zero value of the Riemann. Otherwise, there will be a repetition of the indices in one of these pairs, and the component will be zero. And they tend to be, and they happen to be related to each other. So there's just one independent component. We can rec reconstruct the whole Riemann tensor just out of one component. Let's say. R1212. It's relatively easy to calculate. So we calculate R1212. Uh, since the inverse metric tensor GAB is diagonal and with the 1 1 component being uh, 1, this is the same as R1. Two, one, two. Uh, remember, recall that we've got an expression for the Riemann tensor in terms of the first component raised and all three components and the three other components uh, being low. And this is D1, gamma, one, two, two, minus D2, gamma, one, two, one. And then we've got the products. Let me write them down explicitly. Gamma one A one gamma A two two minus gamma one A two gamma A two one. Okay. Mm. Is it, does it agree with my notes? Yes. Okay. Now the next step is to think which terms of here might contribute because we have relatively few non-vanishing components here, just three. Just three components of the Christopher symbols don't vanish. So we have gamma one, two, two which is non-vanishing and the differentiation was with respect to theta so this one will not vanish on the other hand we've got the derivative of one to one and this one actually does vanish so this contributes nothing then we've got gamma one a gamma a two two it's a product so let's see if any of these guys necessarily vanishes this consists of two two different terms gamma one 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 gamma one to two plus gamma one two one gamma two 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 uh, gamma one 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 certainly vanishes there is no one 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 component here and no two 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 component so this is zero so this is zero in both cases so that's all zero and then we have the last component over here it consists of one Gamma one one two times gamma one two one. Gamma one one two. Does it exist here? No, it's zero. But then we've got also gamma one two two times gamma two two one. And these two are non vanishing. So out of that, what survives is minus gamma one two two times gamma two two one. Okay, let's go to the next. Blackboard. So we've got 
just to write the things gamma one one to two minus gamma one to two gamma two to one uh, this is the derivative with respect to theta of, let's go back here, uh, minus sine theta cosine theta. Minus, and now we've got gamma one to two. That's again minus sinus cosine minus sine cosine. And that's multiplied by gamma two to one, which is the cotan cotangent. Okay, so first we we obtained we're using the the, the product rule for differentiation. This is uh, minus the derivative of sine, which is cosine times cosine, which is cosine squared theta, and then we've got minus sine theta times minus sine theta. So there is a plus here, and then we get sine theta cos theta cotton and theta. This is taken together, since cotton is cosine divided by sine, this is cosine squared. And now we can reduce minus cosine squared with this cosine squared, and we obtain sine squared theta. Okay, so we find out that one R2, one, two is sine squared Theta, and that's all that is to calculate here. Uh, have you got any questions? Okay, I don't see any. So now let's let's move on. The next as uh, next problem is to calculate the Ricci tensor and the Ricci scalar. So if you remember, the Ricci tensor is a symmetric tensor, R and B, which we obtain if we contract the indices one and three of the Riemann. And then the Ricci scalar is something we obtain by contracting the components of the Ricci tensor using the inverse metric. So it's obvious we have to start with the Ricci tensor. Uh, okay, let me go to my next. Yeah, we, there's only three components of the of the Ricci tensor, so we can start, we can go component by component. So we've got R11, which is RC1C1, which is R one 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 but this is obviously zero plus Riemann two one two one now that's not zero and uh, we can write this one as R two one two one g two two because again the metric is diagonal so raising the index is just multiplying by the appropriate diagonal component which is very convenient uh, the two one to one component is the same as the one to one two component so this is just sine squared theta and what is the g upper two two the inverse metric component that's sine to the power of minus two theta so we can write that this is dividing by sine squared theta. 
So this is one. Then we've got the mixed component. Which is one, 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 two, plus R, two, one, two, two. Obviously, this guy is equal to zero. And then this guy over here, that's G one, one, R one, 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 two. Again, we've got a repetition of, uh, of an index within one of the pairs. So this is again, zero. So there is no mixed components of the R tensor, of the Ricci tensor. And then finally, we've got Ricci two, two components. That's Riemann C two, C two. That's R one, two, one, two, plus R two, 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 two. That's zero. But that one is not zero, that's just G11, R12, 1, 2. Again, in a diagonal metric raising indices is cheap, it's just multiplying by the diagonal uh, term in the metric. Uh, this thing here is, by the way, one. And then this thing here is sine squared theta. So this is sine squared theta. Yes. And that's all that is to, to it. So RIB is just one zero zero sine squared theta. Does this ring a bell? This is just the metric. So the reach is identical to the metric. Uh, it's not a normal situation. This is because sphere is a rather surprising type of surface, highly symmetric. And then in the end, we calculate RAB, GAB, which is the Ricci scalar. And that's just uh, R11, E11 plus R22, G22, which is one plus sine square theta divided by sine square theta, which is two. So the Ricci scalar is a constant. It's the same at every point. And again, that's something to be expected. A sphere is a very special type of surface in the sense that it's identical in every point. Uh, meaning if you pick a point over here and over there, you can perform a rotation in this three-dimensional space and just identify this point with that one. And the geometry of the sphere is invariant with respect to rotations. So in a sense, every point on a sphere is equivalent to any other one. This space has a lot of a, a large group of symmetries. If you if you are familiar with <clears throat> mathematical jargon, you understand what this means. What it simply means is that uh, in simple terms, is that when you have two different points, you can perform an appropriate rotation of your two-dimensional sphere, which identifies these two points. And because of that, the geometry at every point is the same. This may seem surprising because when you look at this metric, uh, it obviously depends on theta. So it seems that there is a, the metric is not invariant. It, it, it depends at least on the theta variable, but in fact, the reason why why the metric appears to depend on on the uh, on one of the angles is that the coordinate system uh, breaks this this symmetry. So let me draw it over here. We've got our sphere, and the standard spherical coordinate system defines the theta equal to pi half, which is sort of an equator. And then the geometry in this coordinate system appears a little different depending on your uh, latitude or on the theta azimuthal angle, simply because the constant theta curves are 
uh, circles of different radius. So because of that, the geometry will appear a bit different when you write it, when you write the metric uh, as a component in the theta phi frame, it will appear different depending on theta, but that's just the artifact of the coordinate system. Uh, unfortunately, there is no coordinate system which would make the uh, homogeneity of a sphere explicit. There is no coordinate system in which the metric is constant. It's a, it's a sad but deep fact in differential geometry. So the sphere itself and its geometry is identical everywhere. The curvature is constant all across the surface, but the coordinate system somehow breaks this symmetry. Uh, and this is not apparent when you look at the metric itself. Uh, have you got any questions to this particular example? Uh, I have one thing in my yes. mind. So uh, when you say that there is no such coordinate system which defines this kind of sphere, is it because that, are you talking about the isotropic nature of the sphere where every point is identical to each other? So there should be just one, um, one parameter that defines the whole sphere? Uh, what what I mean is that there is no coordinate system in which the components of the uh, metric tensor are constant. Ah, okay, okay. In that case, it would be kind of obvious by inspection that just like a flat plane, the uh, just think about a plane or the Minkowski space. You don't have any kind of dependence of the coefficients on 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 the position on theta phi or what, whatever you call the components. And it's kind of obvious that every point is equivalent to every other because every point sees exactly the same metric in, in, in this coordinate system. There is no coordinate system of this kind on a sphere because that would be a Euclidean coordinate system. And this metric has an unvanishing curvature. Uh, this is very much related to the problem of um, uh, of mapping a sphere to a plane, to a plane, and 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 trying to produce as uh, adequate projection of the Earth's uh, surface to a flat surface as possible. It turns out that it's not possible to find a perfect map, and this is very much related to the curvature of the sphere not being equal to two. Differential geometry has a lot to say about uh, various types of projections of uh, of the uh, spherical surface of Earth. Uh, into a plane when you want to construct a global map of the world. It turns out that you have to make compromises uh, between various uh, between various types of uh, various types of compromises regarding what features of uh, of the projections you want to retain. And the reason why you have to do it is it has again something to do with the fact that the surface is curved and the Riemann tensor does not is not equal to two. This is a fascinating topic, but a bit too far from, from what we're doing right now. Yeah, I just had one last question, I guess, to ask. Uh, it's on this topic itself. So the thing is that when we are, uh, like when you're saying that this is the sphere, so then these are the reduced coordinates, right? There is no such other coordinates where we can have a lower parameterization than this one, right? So is uh, this the reduced coordinate for sphere? Reduced coordinates. I don't know, know what you mean by reduced coordinates. These um, are, in a sense, the simplest coordinates for a sphere. Yes. yes. The simplest in the sense that uh, this is the coordinate system everybody uses for a couple of reasons. One of them is that it's relatively easily related to the... So, so typically, we don't think of a sphere as an object in itself. We think that it's in, embedded in an implicit three-dimensional space over here. And in that case, the relation between these theta and phi and the three uh, Cartesian components is relatively simple. Uh, it's the well-known relation that x cosine theta cosine phi, y is, sorry, sine theta cosine phi, sine theta sine phi, and z is cosine theta. So this coordinate system is simple in the sense that this relation is relatively simple. On top of that, this coordinate system is very well adapted to thinking in terms of uh, spherical harmonics. So usually we, we like to decompose man, various components, various functions on a sphere in terms of spherical harmonics, and these particular coordinates work very well with that. And in that sense, this is the, 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 the most widely used coordinate system on a sphere, but there are other coordinate systems you can use. 
Uh, there are coordinate mm -hmm. systems which which come from projections of of a sphere onto a plane. This is very much related to the problem of of uh, uh, of uh, drawing an appropriate map of a spherical uh, of the spherical surface of Earth. But that's a bit of a complicated thing. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So that was the first example of calculating the Riemann tensor. Uh, it was two dimensional because of that, it was a relatively simple one. Now let's go to dimension four. So we will calculate the Riemann of a flat of this flat space time. Uh, so if you remember, uh, we showed at some point that it is possible to uh, present, uh, to define a coordinate system on the Minkowski space in which the line element takes the following form as the sigma squared. That's the uh, Ringler's accelerating coordinates. Uh, so since this is just accelerating coordinates in Minkowski, we are looking at a flat space-time in this guise. Uh, it seems that there is some kind of dependence on. Sorry, this was supposed to be. This is supposed to be a. Uh, yes. Uh, there is a dependence on one of these components over here. Uh, however, we know very well that there's, an, there's a transformation of these coordinates back to the flat space time, so the Riemann has to be zero. We know that there is Cartesian coordinates here, so the Riemann has to be zero, but it will be a, a nice exercise just to calculate it and see if this is really true. So again, uh, we begin by calculating the Christopher symbols, and we do it. Let me write it here. We need to calculate the Christopher symbols. Again, we do it using the Lagrangian method. The Lagrangian takes a fairly simple form. Uh, the derivative with respect to x dot, well, let's begin with sigma. With respect to sigma dot, that's minus a squared over, there is no over two, a squared sigma dot, because this is the only term which depends on sigma. Uh, we can calculate the derivative with respect to the parameter. Again, we are talking about a parameterized curve in which sigma, x, y, and a depend on lambda. Mm, so we will get minus a squared sigma double dot minus two a dot sigma dot. That's what you get by differentiating this with respect to lambda. Then we can do the x dot. Here, the result is very simple. That's equal to x double dot. And the same for, for y. Oh, and we can also, we also notice that the Lagrangian does not depend on sigma explicitly. So this is zero and the same goes for X and Y. And finally, we've got A as a component. Mm, 
we got simply a dot. So the derivative here is simple. That's a double dot. But there is an explicit dependence of the Lagrangian on the A coordinate. So we got minus A, because we got two A, which then uh, cancels this one half here. Uh, minus A sigma dot squared. Okay, so let's begin with this equation over here. So we have minus a square sigma double dot minus two a dot sigma squared. That's this thing over here. And we have to subtract this, which is zero. So we can rewrite this equation as sigma double dot plus two over a word sorry there is an a here i forgot about this a if we differentiate that we get to a a dot so there's an a here it's good that i've got my notes over here there's an a here and here we got two over eight a dot sigma dot equals to zero that's the first equation Then we go to the second one. Mm. So the equations for X are very simple. X double dot equal to zero and Y double dot equals to zero. Write x double dot minus zero equal to zero and the same for y. And finally, we've got the a equation. A double dot minus this thing here, which is plus a sigma dot squared equals to zero. Equals to zero. And I will write this equation over here. Mm -hmm. The coordinate system is sigma x, y, a. So what do we know about the Christopher symbols now? So this, this gives us the gamma zero components and the only non-vanishing will be gamma zero three equals to gamma zero three zero and they they sum up to two over a sigma dot a dot so each of them separately needs to be uh, one over a yeah uh, here we have components gamma three and the only non vanishing seems to be gamma three zero zero and it's equal to a. And then gamma one alpha beta equals to gamma two alpha beta. All of that is zero. Yes, so we have three non vanishing components gamma zero zero three, gamma zero three zero, and gamma three zero zero. All of them, all of other components vanish. So not that many non-trivial gammas. Mm. Yes. Okay, so now calculate the Riemann. Just to remind you, R mu mu alpha beta is B alpha gamma mu mu beta minus B beta gamma mu mu alpha plus gamma mu sigma alpha gamma sigma mu beta minus gamma 
Jo sigma beta, gamma, sigma, mu, alfa. Okay, so let's, there's a lot of components of the Riemann, as many as 20, but not that many uh, gamma coefficients and also not that many derivatives. So in this case, it's best to approach this problem instead of writing uh, the Riemann component by component and calculating which of them, uh, what is the value of each of them. The best strategy is to first think which of them have any chance of non-vanishing because they contain non-vanishing components of gamma or their derivatives. So uh, when it comes to derivatives, uh, the only non-vanishing components of derivatives are, uh, so gamma three zero zero, A is X three, so this guy does not vanish. Uh, and also gamma zero zero three, Three equals to gamma zero three zero three. This is mine of one over a squared, and also these don't vanish. Let me use a bit of color to highlight that. This doesn't vanish. This doesn't vanish. This doesn't vanish. This doesn't vanish. Okay, so a term like this, well, a term like this never appears. So, so the Riemann contains the derivatives here and products of gammas. Uh, let's see where we have a chance, in which components we have a chance for a non vanishing derivative or combination of derivatives and non vanishing combination of products. Uh, so we have, let's begin with the derivatives. So gamma three, zero, zero, three, can it appear in, in a Riemann component? Uh, well, it could appear in principle in R uh, three, um, three, zero, and then zero, three. And this is the only type R in minus R three zero three zero, but that's pretty much the same thing up to a sign. So this component and only this component will contain this derivative over here. So this component has a chance of non-vanishing because it contains this thing over here. Uh, On top of that, we've got non vanishing zero, zero, three, three. But this one cannot really appear anywhere in the Riemann because it could, in principle, appear in the derivative of uh, gamma mu nu beta. Mm. in this one over here, but this one is by definition zero. It could also appear here as a, as a minus, and then it would appear in gamma zero, zero. Then this would correspond to that one, to this one, but this is also zero. So this guy over here cannot contribute to the Riemann. Another non-vanishing derivative is right here. And this one could in principle, so let's cross out this one. This one could contribute to zero, three, three, zero equals to minus R zero, three, zero, three. Okay. And that's it. 
mm, there are not, the derivatives of the Christoffels cannot contribute to any other components of the Riemann. Now, what about the products? Uh, just to ask you, is it clear what we are doing here? We're trying to figure out into which components of the Riemann these only non-vanishing derivatives can contribute. And it turns out that there is only two components, free zero, zero, free. And of course, the one with inverted fits here and zero, free, free, zero. They are, by the way, related because you can lower the index over here and find out that uh, that's pretty much the same component, but it doesn't really matter. At the moment, we have found these components. But then we also have products, and it's important to see uh, where the into which products these non-vanishing components could contribute. Mm. So we've got zero, three, and three, zero. So in order for them to contribute, you have to have a match between the index here and the index here. So one of the lower indices has to match one of the upper indices. Let's see when it happens with these guys over here. So we've got gamma zero three zero with gamma three zero zero. Okay, but here we have a repetition of the final index. And again, this will uh, this term will be canceled in the anti-symmetrization. The resulting thing has to be anti-symmetric, so these guys have to vanish. They cannot contribute. But we can also have the product of gamma three zero zero and gamma zero three zero. This one with that one. Again, we've got a repetition of index, so this will be zero after anti-symmetrization. This is again zero after anti-symmetrization. So it does not contribute. Then we could potentially have gamma three zero zero gamma zero, zero, three. And that's a bit of a different story. This one does contribute and contributes to Riemann R three, zero, that's the summation index, gamma zero, Um, this is mu alpha, so let's go back here. Uh, this would be mu, this would be alpha, so this would be three, zero. This would be mu, which is this one over here, zero, and this would be alpha three. Or the other way around, it also contributes to three, zero, three, zero. And we also can have gamma zero zero products of these things here. Gamma zero zero three gamma zero zero three. But again, this does not contribute because there is a repeated index. But we could also have, have gamma zero zero three gamma zero three zero. And here we don't have a repeated index. This guy could contribute to Riemann R zero. This is all, this is mu, this would be alpha. This is mu, 
and this is beta or it's inverse zero free zero free so this guy appears in this uh, component over here So the only non vanishing are three zero 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 three, that's correct. And zero zero three zero three zero, that's correct. Yeah, and I think these are all possible options. So you can check yourself that uh, we need to find a situation when one of these guys meets one of either itself or so so when a Christopher symbol from this set meets another one in a product like this. And I claim that these are the three on, these are the only five options. And it turns out that only two of them seriously contribute to particular components of the Riemann. So in the end of the day, this is the list of components we will deal with. It's three zero zero three equals to minus zero three zero and zero three three zero. And this one goes to again three zero zero three and this to zero three three zero. Okay, so it seems that there is only two serious components we will need to calculate are three zero zero three and R zero. Three, three, zero, uh, which are independent and which have any non vanishing contributions from the crystals here. So calculate that and we'll do it next time. Fortunately, it's not that difficult. Okay, I think it's the time is up. Do you have any questions to this to these calculations over here? Okay, I don't see any. So, uh, yeah, in this case, this is, we are only having one hour of the lecture today, uh, and see you next week.